Sounds good, man. How are you? I'm doing well, Adam. How about yourself? It's been I'm a long great. Time. It's been a long time, man. Long time, no talk. But yeah, uh, yeah man, I saw you just uh, ran Rio del Lago. So I wanted to hear about that. I don't know a whole lot about that race and it looks like you've done it a few times. Yeah. But uh, yeah, man, I wanted to reach out and just say what's up. Uh, I remember you being one of my early influencers back in the day. Cool. <laughs> I yeah, think, I think uh, we met. I think we met through like the whole Ryan Dexter thing. I would, you know, early on, he was somebody that was kind of a, you know, a mentor of mine as I was sort of moving beyond like 50k, 50 mile, or getting into the longer distance stuff. He's up in Wisconsin. I think you were too, right? I, think I that's was too. How we, yeah. And you ran some paths. races in the Midwest. Did you ever live in the Midwest, or how did you get? Linked yeah, up I with did. Ryan? I, I I started in. Um, I grew up in around Springfield, Illinois, and then. Uh, uh, lived in the St. Louis area, probably when I started doing the ultra running thing. So I've done McNaughton, the yep. old McNaughton in Illinois. Yep. I've done Ozark Trail, Berryman. Uh, I've done a bunch of those kind of Midwest, right? Uh, Kettle Moraine, Kettle Moraine. Ice yep. Age, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's cool. Yep. I cut my teeth all there for the first 10 or so years, maybe eight years of doing ultras was, okay. was in that area. Okay. Yeah. Pretty much same here, man. How yeah. did you meet Ryan Dexter? At McNaughton. So oh, really, um, yeah, McNaughton was my first ultra. And back when I first did it, gosh, what would that have been? 2000. Sorry, I'm looking at a poster that I've got a Leadville <laughs> poster over there. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, and that, that was 210, probably 2006, I think. I did the 30 miler there. Okay. Um, I think he was doing the 100. And then I went back the next year because I was like, I had such a bad race. I was never going to run an ultra trail race again. <laughs> and, uh, they got rid of the 30, so I'm like, well, I'll do the 50. And then I ended up doing like four 50s that year and kind of hooked up with Ryan through that. And then he just asked me to crew him for, I think, the 150 or for a 200. Okay. And we just kind of got close after that. So, yeah. yeah. And did you do, uh, so there was two Potawatomi races, if I remember right. There was one, like, the one one was in Illinois, and, and then the other one was like on the East Coast or something. Yeah. Yeah, okay. the old RD uh, took took the McNaughton like name, right? And it was in McNaughton Park, but he took the McNaughton name and then he moved out to Pittsfield, Vermont and kind of started mm -hmm. his own race series and stuff out there and then okay. called it the McNaughton whatever, you know. And yeah. I think Ryan, Ryan actually did a 200 out there yeah. and I went and crewed him out at that. And that's been, gosh, at least 10 years ago. Yeah. Back before yeah. 200s were popular. I know. I was just going to say, Dexter was doing the 200s before. Yeah, now they're getting huge, but he yeah. was doing them way back and, and yeah. winning, doing well, because not many people would show up on race day for those 200-mile races. No, they were pretty – it was a lot smaller, a lot less sophisticated. You know, there weren't there weren't kind of the spot trackers and kind of the – you know, it, it's gone a, a, it's changed a lot in the last, you know, five to ten years on that front. So, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I mean, way different. It's not like – the 200s, I mean, I'm, I'm out here in Portland now, so so some of those 200s are kind of in this area. Um, gosh, what's the what Bigfoot is out, mm. is not too far from here. I've actually yep. ran an aid or worked an aid station at that oh, before. Cool. It's like backcountry, middle of nowhere. Mm. A lot of those other early ones were a little more self-contained. They're like 10-mile loops or something right. like that, so it's a little easier to kind of manage what was, uh, what was going on. Yeah. Yeah, so you were helping Dexter, like you were pacing, crewing, and you were part of his crew for a while for a lot of races, right? Like hanging out with yeah. Dima and Dexter, all those guys. Yeah, D in fact, Dima's probably the guy I've stayed closest with. Uh, Dima has helped me out over the years at a couple of different races, Ozark Trail. Uh, he came out to Leadville and helped me. He actually came out here to Portland and drove out and visited me last year, me and the family. So I I've stayed pretty close to Dima. Um but yeah, I, I helped out. I'm trying to think. I helped out at two 200s, which is like a five day commitment, right? Each <laughs> of them, they're so stinking long comparatively to 100. Um, so I helped out at a couple of, I think that's it really. I think I helped out at a couple of, of 200s for Ryan. And then a couple of the guys on his crew, Dima, went out and ran, ran Leadville, and I helped him. Uh, at that race. And then another guy, Randy, that was part of Ryan's crew, I helped him out at Leadville also. I think that was the last time I saw you, if I remember right. Uh, yeah. I saw you uh, down at Winfield waiting for okay. waiting for your runner. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, it was Randy. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I'm pretty sure you ran Kettle 100 the first year I ran the 100K there. Yeah. 
And I think so we ran for a little bit together. We ran for a little while together. And I'm trying yep. to remember, were, were you on um, the Daily Mile way back before Strava? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So sure. I might've known you from there too. So yeah. yeah, it's funny how this stuff's evolved, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's crazy. And uh, we're like pioneers in the, in the sport at this point. We're like the alumni crew. <laughs> we're at least in that, we're at least in that like middle group, right? I mean, yeah. there's some really like incredible little old guys and gals, right. That have just been doing this like before, you know, we talk, oh, there wasn't any technology. Like before that, there was like nothing. Right? Right. <laughs> so we've got all this like nutritional stuff and, you know, watches and gadgets and, and ways to track. And uh, mm. it's definitely, and just the ability, I, I think the knowledge thing is probably the biggest thing now mm. that exists that didn't before. Like, I mean, when I kind of got into it, so I'm, I'm buddies with Yassine, Yassine Daboon and him and I knew each other like we got into the sport at about the same time and we hang out out here because we knew each other's blogs like back in 2007 you know what right. I mean nobody really has a blog in that same kind of format anymore right yeah. so now you've got Instagram you can find somebody immediately right that's how you and I reached you know that's how you reached out to me but you get a lot more of that like real-time feedback from this kind of stuff and tracking and you kind of go back like even five years before all that started there just wasn't much there, right? Just the, there's more races, there's more everything. There's just a lot more to tap into than, than uh, that, uh, those initial pioneers, if you will, <laughs> kind of getting their, getting their feet wet in this stuff. Totally. Well, I specifically remember, and I'm pretty sure it was your blog that I was reading, but I specifically remember reading about your Leadville experience because at the time I hadn't done Leadville yet and I was yeah. still living in the Midwest. And I, and to, to me, Leadville was like this impossible race that I just yeah. couldn't imagine doing. And I remember reading your blog and by the time, if I remember right, by the time you were coming down Hope Pass for the second time, you and your, whoever was crewing you started yelling, big buckle, big buckle. That's it. Yeah, it was Dima. Yeah. Yeah. It okay. was me and Dima. I, yeah. It was, you know, I grew up, I mean, I still live at sea level. Portland's, I mean, 500 feet. That's what I was back in Illinois too. Um, I just have a little bit more access to altitude, but it's still not Leadville type altitude. I mean, you're still not getting up to you can get up to 10,000 a little higher if you go like five hours east, but it's, it's pretty tough to get up that high. But yeah, um, I hung out out there, I think 10 days before the race. So I've got a job mm. that I guess the, has worked well. I mean, pandemic wise, like I've worked from home for basically 15 years. Mm. So, or remote, bit remote. have the ability to work remote. So I just hung out in a motel eight out there for like 10 days before the race. And uh, my, I almost even split Leadville. I just like, mm. I just kind of had my red line that I stayed at and I just really didn't slow down from it. I never got faster, but I never really slowed down from it. But yeah, coming off of hope, I think just getting, getting some air back in my, my lungs, head, not feeling quite as bad. Uh, maybe a little, uh, you know, exhaustion, things are feeling pretty good. A little mm -hmm. lightheadedness. I don't know what it was, but yeah, we were, Demo was the, the perpetrator of, uh, yelling big buckle because okay. we could kind of feel we were building some momentum it felt like we'd lost it and then it's always a good lesson of a long race like if you just stay at it you might get it back and we got yeah it. yeah yeah that's such a good feeling at that race too when you're coming down uh hope pass for the second time and you're building momentum you know you're not really yep. slowing down you know you still have some gas in the tank yep and you finished sub 24 that year. So hats off. Yeah, I think I would, yeah, 23, 45, nice. something, something like that. So yeah, yeah. that was, uh, that, yeah, I was under 24. So, I mean, at the time I thought like, well, this is it. Like, it's not going to get better. Like I'm, I'm never going to run a race faster than this. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know. I mean, at the time it was, it was my second hundred. So, you know, I didn't have a ton of experience, but you know, I think a lot of people getting into the sport, like that goal of going sub 24 at a hundred miles is kind of what you think about. So that's kind of opened my door to like, well, if I can, if I can, I mean, at the time it was like, well, I don't know. I'll ever do anything else like this. But then looking back, it was like, I had this confidence of like, okay, that I can go faster, mm -hmm. you know, than, than this. And that was, I mean, that was 11 years ago now. And I'm, I'm running faster now than I was then. So and nice I'm 43, not 33. So yeah. Beautiful. Yep. So how are you keeping it up, man? Um, you're still out there killing it and you're running yeah. faster than you were 10 years ago. Um, I'm in my forties. I'm 46. I got a couple years on you, but yeah. like, how, how are you getting faster, man? You know, I, I think 
the one benefit that I've had is the fact that I've had a busy job and I've had kids the whole time I've done this. And I, I don't mean that in any way, like negatively towards someone that doesn't. It's just, it's, it's only given me a certain amount of space to, to train in. I, I can't train 18 hours a, a week. Right. I'd love to, right? I really would. <laughs> but it's just, I just don't have the ability to do it. And I think that has kept me sort of at this consistency level of, I don't really ever like detrain necessarily. I mean, I'll take, I'm, I'm kind of in a two week break since I just did a hundred last weekend, but I'm always in this like 50 ish mile a week range. Hmm. And then as I get a little closer to a race, I kind of sharpen the saw. So, you know, a little more speed work or a little more hills, a little more volume, and I'll kind of peak up a little bit and then I'll come back down. I'll run the race. I'll take a little bit of time back and then I'll get back to that like 50 ish miles a week. And, and I think I'm just a consistency person um, because I found that that works for me. It keeps me from getting sick. It keeps me fit enough to like, now that I live here, like adventures are a much bigger thing than, than when I lived back in the Illinois, Missouri area. Like you couldn't just go on a backcountry jaunt in the St. Louis area. I can do that here pretty easily. I can drive an hour. I can go around Mount Hood. I can drive an hour. I can go around Mount St. Helens. I can drive an hour and a half. I can do a two day trip around Rainier. So this sort of, I like to be like an adventure shape and that 50 ish miles a week. And that's trail running and, and road running and stuff, but it keeps me in a good spot. And I think that's just been the, the key, you know, is like, uh, is that, and I do a little bit of strength training. I do a little bit of mobility work, but for the most part, I think it's just being consistent. Not a lot of peaks and valleys, just plateaus with some, with some peaks and then back down to some plateaus. Nice. Yeah. Consistency yeah. says a lot. I mean, yeah, it sounds like that's the key for you. Um, so with a family and a full-time job, um, what do you do for a living, by the way? Yeah, I work for Microsoft. I'm a, I'm a cloud architect. Okay, okay. Yeah. And so you're working from home most of the time. Um, when are you doing your training? Is it early in the morning, late at night, all the above? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm actually more of an evening type of runner. So I like to, uh, mornings, I usually run early on the weekends because I run longer. So those are usually my, you know, 20, 25 mile type stuff on a Saturday. So I'm usually out of the house pretty early on those days, but other days, because I have a flexible job, sometimes, you know, I've, I've got seven, eight, nine, ten 10 planned and a meeting gets canceled. Maybe I do it at lunchtime. Maybe I do it at six o'clock at night, but I'm, I'm more likely to, I don't want to say sleep in because I still get up at six 30, you know, cause I got to get kids off to school and that kind of stuff, but I'm more likely to run in the afternoon or the evening than I am mornings, especially during the week. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel so. like you're more warmed up. Uh, I feel like for some reason I'm a little bit faster, a little bit sharper when I run in the afternoon. I think it gives me something to look forward to. Okay. Like it's, I know there's, there's both sides of it, right? Sometimes I, 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 I've got some, a buddy that I'll meet with sometimes on a Thursday and we'll do speed work. He's the 30 year old. He keeps me young. And, uh, so I run with him and, and we'll go in the morning and, and it's kind of awesome because it's done. Right. And I think like, well, what am I going to do the rest of the day? But then I also like am working and work gets stressful or whatever. Like I don't have my outlet. I mean, I can always run again, I suppose, but I don't have that like outlet that I look forward to when the, when the clocks stopped, right. When, when work day's over to like go out and do that thing. So I think I like, I like the, I like the feeling of an early morning run because it's like out of the way and you can just whatever, mow the yard or get, get your chores done that you, right. that you don't do because running gets in the way. But I really like kind of looking forward to, to what I can do. And I think from a mental standpoint, it sort of keeps me on task of like, I don't want to do this maybe today because X, Y, and Z came up, but I still get it done. Then I get that kind of mental boost of like, I still made this work, even though the day was busy and you know, maybe a thousand other people put their run off and didn't do it, but I'm out doing it. So right. little mind tricks, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And are your wife and kids pretty supportive of your running? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. My, my wife's been a big part of it for the whole time. Um, so, I mean, I, there's no way I could, I could do this. Cause even, even 50, 60 miles a week is still like eight to 10 hours right. away from home. Yeah. Um, especially on the weekends when it's, you know, big run in the mountains or something like that, that takes some driving and stuff. So she's super supportive. They're, 
they they're into it. They like it. We don't do as much together as we used to. Um, so when I first got married, you're right. You don't have kids. You just got a dog or something like that. It's a lot easier for, was a lot easier for her to come crew for me. Uh, and then when we only had one, it was also, we could just sort of throw the one in the back of the car and kind of do it like that. But now that we've got two, it's, it's definitely a lot tougher. So, but yeah, they're super supportive. They loved when I did the hurt 100, uh, a couple of years ago. Cause oh, yeah. we got to go to Hawaii. To Hawaii. So, yeah, right. Who's going to complain about Hawaii in January <laughs> when you live in the Pacific Northwest? Um, so yeah, super supportive. Yeah, they're they're great. I I couldn't, I wouldn't, and couldn't do this if I didn't have uh, support by them. It'd be too much of a, I think a, a mental strain if it was a big if it was a big weight on the family. Yeah, I mean you've got to have support doing this stuff. Yeah, yeah. no kidding. So and good crew, right? Good friends too. So that that helps, right? And that's been a big part of it. Is now that I'm out here, I've, there's more people in the community than where I lived before. So I've got good crew, you know, that I can grab almost at a moment's notice and pull some people together and, and they can come help. So there's also confidence. Like my wife's not worried, like, Oh, he's out there in the middle of nowhere by himself. It's like, yeah. like I got my buddies with me and we're, we're, we're out there doing our thing. So it just makes it a little easier that way. Nice. Is the running community pretty big out there? It is. Yeah. Um, you know, I mentioned you seen, you seen in his business partner, Willie, our, our, they run the Y East Wolf Pack. They've got a group. There's the Trail Factor running group. There's the Backcountry Rise running people. I mean, there's a lot out here. We have a lot of stuff out here too, right? And that's just sort of, I mean, I named three Portland groups. There's probably more. There's the Northwest Dirt Turners. And then, so there's always like, there's always kind of, I mean, COVID obviously has put a little bit of a damper on things, but there's always like a group run on a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday that you can jump into, right? And go jump and have a little social outlet and grab a peer, beer and some pizza afterwards. Uh, and then find a training partner, which is what, you know, mm -hmm. kind of how I did all this stuff. That's kind of how I found somebody to, to go hang with. Cause I've been here just a little over seven years. I uh, spent my whole life back in that St. Louis kind of area. Uh, and then we just moved out here just to kind of get some new air, if you will and uh, try a new area out. So yeah, awesome, awesome community out here. And you can find Adventure Buddy pretty much every weekend. That's cool. Yeah. So how did you get into this crazy sport? Like back in, back in our days, there wasn't a yes. ton of information online. Um, no. You know, I came up through the, the Dean Carnaz's book and eventually Born to Run came out. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, back in the day, it was just reading blogs. And there wasn't even a whole lot of blogs back in the day. So how did you even find this weird sport? Ah, there it there is. <laughs> Ultra marathon, man. Yeah. It's the same thing, right? Like, I mean, all of us that kind of were in that, like, that have been around for about 15 years or so, I think we are all sort of at that same, that same point of, I was, I was powerlifting at the time and had no interest. I mean, I ran track in high school, but I went to such a small school. Like we only had the major sports. We didn't have cross country. So it was like track, basketball, baseball, football, like we didn't even have a soccer team. So, um, I did, I played football and I ran track. And then when I got done with high school, I, I was like, oh, that's it. So I got into powerlifting and that was it. And just saw, sort of thought that was going to be what I was going to do. And then just by chance, I used to do consulting um, and I was driving from my house over to, you know, the, the business that I was in. It was about a 90 minute drive or whatever every morning. And I'd listen to NPR and Dean Carnassus was on there. And they were talking about the whole, you know, this long distance running. And I was always like, I don't want to look like a Kenyan because I was a meathead <laughs> at the time, right? right. So <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to look like some Kenyan. And he talked about like, he's ordering pizza when he was out running and like all this <laughs> stuff was like, what? I mean, I could get behind that. Like mm -hmm. I liked running when I was in high school. And then there was a guy, uh, Howard, you remember Howard Schaub by chance? He was kind of so. adjacent to Ryan's crew, but um he was a guy that I worked with at the company I was consulting at. And he like talked to me about, Hey, maybe you should get into, you know, maybe you should get into running. And I was like, I, you know, I'd never thought about it. And then he showed me a picture of Dean, right. And he's like crossing the rucky Chucky and he's all buff. And I was like, Oh, well, that's cool. Right? Maybe I'll do that. And so yeah. that was kind of it. And I, I, uh, Howard found the McNaughton 30 and we both were like, let's go do it. Nice. So we just signed up and I had no idea what a trail race was like in my mind, like up by Springfield, there was this like mountain bike trail, but I, I bet it was four miles long and didn't have 
15 feet of gain in it. And like, this is what I'm running on. And I'm thinking like, I got this, I got this down. <laughs> and then I go to McNaughton and McNaughton's like, it's not nothing. I mean, it's a 10 mile loop with like 1300, 1400 feet of gain, maybe 2000 feet of gain per loop. And it's like, it's all these like short 200 feet up and like 200 feet straight down. Yeah. My quads were destroyed. My IT band, I thought it was going to pop out of my leg. Like I was a mess. And I finish and I'm like, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> and then as I mentioned, I, I, I decided to go back the next year um, and they got rid of the 30. So I jumped up to the 50 and then I just, I had an okay race and just sort of got the bug. And here I am, I guess, 15 years later or whatever the number is. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Dean, right. The Dean Carnassa stuff. That's how I got started too. Uh, yeah. That was a huge influence for me. I mean, yeah, yeah, that book was pretty crazy at the time, you know? Yeah. This mm -hmm. guy's ordering pizzas out on his runs. And I thought, well, you know, this, I might be able to do something like this. Yeah. Right. Well, um, yeah, man. So, and, uh, what was your first hundred miler then? It was McNaughton. Yeah. McNaughton. So it was like, that was my first, like everything race. It was okay. my first 30 It was my first 50 and it was my first hundred. Ah. Yeah. Okay. So you got a special relationship with that one. I do. Yeah. And I went back a couple of years, maybe a little more seasoned and at the hundred and tried to, tried to run a good time there. So yeah, I, I, I keep thinking I, it's around Easter every year and mm -hmm. all my family, my wife's family are still back there. Um, so I thought a couple times about going back and giving it a, another mm -hmm. shot, see what I can do, see what I could do up there. Now that I've got, I live somewhere very hilly. Like, even though we're not at low altitude, like I can get, I can't leave my house and not get a thousand feet of gain. So uh, on a, any run over five miles, maybe 800 feet, but it, it's very hilly. I'm just sort of in the middle of the hill. I have to go up or I have to go down. Um, so I just have more just like vert, just, you know, as part of just my daily life than I did before. Um, so I'd love to go back there. I think I'd probably have a little better, a little better races than I've had in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you were doing some power lifting. Um, you mean like Olympic lifts, like the three big lifts type of thing or what were yep, you into? Dead, yeah. I mean, I was doing like, you know, uh, bench, deadlift, squat. So yeah. I was in the thousand pound club when I was in college. Whoa. I was 132 pounds. So I was, <laughs> <laughs> holy I cow, no kidding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I was probably, I mean, all things told, I'm probably a far better weightlifter than I am a runner. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know what I was anyway. This just, this just fits. This just feels better, I guess. <laughs> And you said you're, you're still doing some strength training from time to time. Uh, is, is, it, is it any of the same workouts? Are you still including you know, those three big lifts or where are you at? Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, especially being older, right? It's like deadlifts and squats are really good for you, right? Mm -hmm. They're testosterone boosters, which we're not building a whole lot of anymore. Right. Um, but it's a lot more functional stuff than it is like max out reps or anything like that. So it's, it's, it's a lot of, I do a lot of body weight stuff. I've got pull up bars. I've got free weights. So it's it's more of those kind of those kinds of lifts. But definitely having that like background knowledge has been extremely helpful. You know, yeah. especially in injury prevention and those kind of things. Mm, yeah. Have you ever utilized the coach? I have. Yeah, yeah. a couple different times. Okay. Yeah, and for me, it's it's uh, motivation's not the problem. Um, sometimes though, I can get in a rut, and it's easy to just run the same route, do the same workouts all the time. Uh, and I think there's some definite benefit of, I wouldn't, I don't have a consistent coach. I generally have like, okay, I got into this race that I wasn't expecting to, or I've got a race coming up and I want to try to PR it and I will get a coach and do like a, you know, an eight week or something like that sort of like build to, help me like maximize my, my time. Right. So again, just, and a lot of it has to do with seasonality of my job. My summertime gets very, that's the end of our fiscal year. So it can get busy. And a lot of those races are July, late June. And I'm super busy during that time. Um, and luckily we've got some awesome benefits where I can use uh, basically a stay fit kind of fund for coaching. So I'll use some of that for a coach and basically let them like build out my schedule and then I don't have to think about it. All I have to do is pull up the website and go, okay, I'm doing, you know, some 800s today, or I'm doing a steady state 10 miler. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I've absolutely used coaches before. I've used Jeff, Jeff Browning, um, mm -hmm. who's been awesome. So he helped me a lot with diet. I always have had stomach issues. 
Um, so he was really good for that. And I used Matt Hart, uh, before that. Mm, cool. Okay. So Jeff Joe, coaches, Matt doesn't. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. so Jeff Browning, um, if he helped you out with your diet, I'm guessing you were doing the high fat, low carb thing. I was. Yeah. Yeah. Are you still it's a or... good tool. No, yeah. I don't. It's, it's too hard for me to maintain. So it is. It's very tough you know, to it's, maintain. It's, it's very tough. I got some absolute benefits from it. And it's a really, I think like a lot of stuff, it's good to like experiment and try like 30, 60, 90 days of something else just to see what you can get out of it. The good thing I think I pulled from it was like, just got a better relationship with like being, being hungry and like kind of the signals of like, just cause I'm hungry doesn't mean I need to like eat a bunch of chips or like, it, because that's kind of has the tendency to like, I sit there and eat while I'm trying to decide what I want to eat versus <laughs> choosing like better choices of the foods that I am going to eat. Um, so I think it gave me a little bit better kind of idea of food and just like society and all this sort of like, I don't know, I was definitely too carb heavy before. And I think I was feeling some ill effects of that, things like being hangry. And it was interesting to pull away from that and not have those sensations anymore and not feel like, and not bonk on a run, which was pretty wild to like go through this, like basically transformation where you're, you know, you're, you're lever able to leverage your fat stores more. And I'm not a big guy, right? I'm a five foot five, I'm 130 pounds. So I'm not somebody that has fat, you know, per se, right? right? Browning doesn't either. Um, and it was just a really interesting, like, concept to sort of go through. So I still kind of leverage those tools a little bit. I'll do some fasted runs. I'll do some, you know, some times where I'll do um, intermittent fasting and, and not eat in the mornings for, for kind of a period of time. Um, and a lot of that's just to sort of tap into that side and, and you know, not be just sort of a carb monster mm -hmm. if you all, all the time. So it's, uh, that part was good, but yeah, it's, it's an extremely hard thing to to manage, especially with a family of four that also doesn't want to eat like that. So. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's a lot of work, man. It's a lot of food preparation. Uh, it's just a lot of time and thought going into it. But I think it's good to it experiment is. with different types of diets and see what works Absolutely. for you because I think things are going to be different for everybody. Have you ever right. experimented with like a vegetarian or a vegan diet? Early on, I tried that and I just couldn't ever feel good doing mm -hmm. it. Um, I felt like I was always hungry for one. And, um, I, I just didn't feel like I could get enough food in me. Uh, and it felt, uh, felt like too much fiber. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt mm -hmm. like, I felt like I was probably using the restroom more than a person should be. And I thought this isn't right. Like this right. isn't for me. This isn't what a person that lived at any other point in history could deal with. Like if you lived <laughs> out in the wild, you couldn't be using the restroom this much. <laughs> so, right, so right. I, you know, I felt like, like this feels, this doesn't feel like it, it kind of works with, with what I want. And then I was also noticing, I just wasn't recovering very well from, from training, especially with the weightlifting and stuff. I just wasn't getting what I wanted out of it. Yeah. 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 Well, but I would have to, again, you're, no, I was go just ahead. Gonna say you're totally right though. It's like, there's all kinds of people like Yassine's a great friend of mine. He's vegan, like vegan, and mm -hmm. it works great for him. Mm -hmm we've spent tons of time talking about food and all this other stuff. And, and it's, I try, I've tried and it just doesn't, uh, just doesn't mesh with me. So yeah, for sure. Luckily well, we got options, right? Totally, totally. And you got to mix yeah. it up too. And, and like we said, see what works for your body. Um, yeah, yeah, man. So, um, so tell me about this race, uh, Rio del Lago. Um, I don't, it looks yep. like you've done this race a few times. I have. So, it is uh, Rio Del Lago. It's just outside of Sacramento. It's in Folsom, California. So uh, Johnny Cash, Folsom Prison Blues, like uh, yep, you run yep. by that prison. Oh, wow. Uh, so yeah, yeah. And there's a Johnny Cash trail that you're on. It's a weird one um, and not in a bad way, but it's a late season hundred. So the reason I've always done it has been, it's been a fallback race for me. So when I first moved out to this area um, seven years ago, it was like, we moved in August. I kind of missed, we were like, you know, getting stuff ready to move, selling a house. So I didn't run anything in the summer and we got out here and I was like, I don't know, I'd like to do something. And excuse me. That was in driving distance. So I got in the car and drove down there and ran it the first time. 
The second time I did it was coming off of uh, a DNF at Bighorn. So I ran Bighorn, crazy weather. I got all jacked up and hypothermic and, and didn't get a hundred miler. And I had to have a hundred mile streak of at least 100 the last 12 years. Ah. So I didn't, I didn't want to break that streak. So I saw this, I was like, oh yeah, Rio del Lago. So I went down and ran that. And then this year, basically the same thing. COVID was a problem. You know, I signed up for states and whatever that was, 2019, didn't get in, was like waiting to see how the year went. And then um, everything just sort of fell apart, you know, and I didn't really sign up for anything. COVID happened. And then once the season popped back up, everybody had carryovers and I hadn't signed up for anything. So like all the races were semi full. And then I had two buddies that were, uh, that crewed me at Rio Mac and, and Jordan were both running their first hundreds in September. And I, so a lot of races in September. So it's just like, everything just kind of like, I'm just going to go run Rio del Lago again. So it's a, it's about a 400, 425 people sign up for it. Okay. Um, it's in the Western States area mm -hmm. with, without as much vert so uh you don't go up the escarpment so it's more of the it's more of the lower stuff it still has about 12 to 13 k a climb um which i think states has got around 16 so it's a little less than that but no high altitude it's all it's all sea level kind of stuff uh but you run on the western states trail you go across no hands bridge so it's got a lot of that and i guess i i crewed at western states also this year so i've had kind of a full year of other people's races that just, and, and it's totally fine because I've had a ton of help over the years. So, uh, but this was, this was one I just kind of fell back to, and it's a semi-fast course. Um, the first 20 miles are paved. It's pavement, um, like, like inner urban trail kind of stuff. Like you're running along sidewalks, along roads. Uh, and then you kind of get past that spot and you get to around the 40 ish mile mark. And like the majority of the climb sort of exists really in about the back 55 miles. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's the front half is like, I think I was on pace for 16 hours until about mile 44, oh, wow. um, which there was no way I was going to do that. Right. I mean, that's, that's peanut butter spread pace. Not like I was ahead and then with, with time to come back, but peanut butter spread pace pace of, uh, 16 and then I ended up just over 20 uh, just okay. because all the all the climb basically ex exists in the last 55 miles yeah well that's still a great time man that's fantastic oh, no argument this is my second fastest 100 so I'm wow I'm, I'm okay with that wow yeah had you trained specifically for this race or what was the training preparation like a, a little bit um I started kicking in some additional speed work about once a week um as I mentioned a little bit earlier just because I knew the beginning, like, I didn't want to just be in ultra shuffle, shuffle mode. Like, mm -hmm. if I'm going to do a big mountain race, that's far less important because you're hiking a bunch and running downhill. So training just sort of takes care of that. But there's just no substitute for just, like, running at a seven and a half minute pace for 10 miles other than doing it. So I did some stuff like that. I did a little bit of, uh, of speed work um, for the race just to kind of get my legs and hips and everything a little more opened up from the, uh, grindy ultra marathon kind of stuff, you know, that, that would be the standard, um, standard gate. So I think that helped out a bunch. And then I think just, you know, 13,000 is not a ton of vert in our world. Um, so just the normal hills and stuff around the house and in the neighborhoods. Uh, and then I hit, I hit quite a few trails like out in the Columbia river gorge, which is pretty technical, a lot of good vert out in that area too. So I wouldn't say I was like, specific trained for this with the exception of that like one speed workout a week everything else was pretty much my standard my standard kind of training cycles okay yeah. and what's this course like is it an out and back or is it a point it's so not it's, a point to point is it it's not a point to point no so one i would say that anybody that's like looking for a hundred that's like easy to crew like it's this it's oh, really it's awesome i mean so my crew was actually like, we're almost bored. Like this was so easy to do, which is cool. Cause I was at, I am tough. I was at Western States. Like I've been at all these like races that are all over the stinking place to like manage people and get, get to the next point. So the, the first is, is a 20 mile loop. And that's that pavement that I was talking about. You start at the Folsom Lake dam 
and then you kind of go out and you do a loop and you come right back to that same spot. That's the longest you go all day without seeing crew. Then you bounce ahead, you know, kind of on a gravel road about five miles and your crew has to drive about a mile and a half and they're just there waiting for you. Um, but then it's, so it's basically this, it's, it's a loop and then it's like a big lollipop. So you go outbound, you do a big loop, you come back around and then you do that lollipop back to that same place that you started the race, the same place that you, that 20 mile loop came back to. So you hit that start finish area, uh, the start at 20 miles, uh, and then back at the finish. So you hit, the, you hit that spot three times. So that's kind of your like small loop, big loop coming off of that area. Got it. Got it. So again, makes it pretty easy to, to crew from that standpoint. Cause you're just sort of following this little, this little path around and it's adjacent to a town or multiple towns like Auburn, California, like Folsom, California. So there were sections where when I picked up a pacer, I had a 24 mile section after I got my pacer in between crew. So the other two guys like left and went and got food and groceries. It's just a nice, like, no, you don't have to be super stressed out. Like even with a fast runner or fast ish runner, you, you don't have to be like, Oh my God, we're not going to get there. Like we're not going to be able to get to this next spot and freaking out and jumping out of the car. And when you get there, it's like huge parking lots, like a bunch of times, I would just run into a spot and they'd be in a parking lot and they just have my tailgate down and I would just get all my stuff off my tailgate, like cross the mat and turn around and, and go back. So super easy to, to, to manage. So, I mean, anybody that's listening to this, that's looking for like that first hundred that's also working with a crew that hasn't been too seasoned. This would be uh this is the one to do it for this is the one. Or a seasoned crew. They can knock it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, with your experience, you've been doing this for almost 15 years. Like, how are you feeling when you walk up to the start line? Like, are you pretty confident these days? Do you still get nervous at all? Like, or are you just like, well, you know, here it is another hundred, uh, you know, we'll just see where what the next 24 hours takes me. It's all of the above, I think. And I was, so I finished reading this book, um, courage is calling. I actually li finished listening to it during, during, during the race. And it was giving me kind of these thoughts of like, it's a, and, and it's sort of like what, what courage is and, and kind of talks through some things like that. And I was thinking about like, what did it take the first time I stepped up to do a hundred miler? And I know what I felt like. I was nervous. I had butterflies in my stomach and I don't have that anymore. And the reason I don't is because I've practiced, right? I've, I've, I've been up to that. I mean, I've DNF'd five times, but I've finished 14 of these. So I've had like 20 shots at this stuff. Um, and I definitely feel different now than I do then. And, and I mean, I even think there's a little bit of a little bit of a detriment to that where it's, it's a little harder to like, I think going as far into the well on number 14 as I went on number one or two. Um, because I, I'm at a point now where like, unless something really bad goes wrong, I'm going to make it like, mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm fast enough overall, like I'm not fighting cutoffs. In fact, the first Rio Del Lago that I ran, I like stepped down off of something and had a terrible groin, like a groin pull during the race. And I had like eight hours to do the last 20 miles to break 24 hours. And I'd like just looked at my father-in-law was crewing me. I'm like, I can just walk this in eight hours. And I did. I just went out and walked the 10 mile out and back or 10 miles out and 10 miles back and made it. And if I'd have been like earlier and I'd have been freaked out, like, I don't know what I'm going to do. So there's the positive of that. But then there's this race of, I ran 2008. I started puking at mile 90 or 86. And I think if it would have been my first race and I'd have been that close to 20 hours, I might've dug a little deeper in the well, but I also was like, there's nobody within 30 minutes of me. <laughs> like I knew that, like I'm in the top 15, nothing changes if I, bury myself or if I just kind of like go moderate hard like so there's a little bit of that that changes I think that you know for me has 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 changed in terms of like how deep in the well I can go and especially on a race that I've done three times it, it, if it was western states because I've never gotten into it maybe I'd have it or hard rock maybe I'd have a different different relationship with that but in this instance I kind of went there of like, I want to beat the time zone change. So I wanted to be done by 2 a.m. So that was a 
20 hour. Well, we started 15 minutes late. So I knew it was like, I was going for 21 hours. And I was like, if I can break 21, that'd be pretty awesome. Cause I've only done that one other time. Um, so I was like, all right, let's do that. I had like 20 was out of, was out of reach. I knew that wasn't happening <laughs> and I knew I was going to get in under the 20 hours and 45 minutes. So I kind of got in a space where it was like, I kind of mailed it in a little bit in the last handful of miles. And I was still running, but it wasn't like tongue hanging out of my mouth, kind of running. It was just like, I'm going to get there. We'll get there. You know, we're going to get there in 12 minutes versus nine minutes and that's okay. So, yeah. um, so I know that was a lot more than you asked ask me for, but, but I don't have the same butterflies in my stomach. It's sort of like, and this race was a really good example of that. I, I didn't have a mantra necessarily. I just told myself like, it's been a crazy year. It's been hard for my kids. It's been hard for everybody, right? Like relationships and just mental and all this sort of stuff. Like, I'm just going to go out here and be grateful that I have the ability to do this. I had very minimal, like planning. I would just kind of get to my crew and just be like, give me one of those and one of those. And I'd stick it in my pocket and I'd leave. There was no like real cadence of like, I got to have this and I got to have that. And I got to have that. So some of that's confidence with being around for a while. Um, and some of it was, I just didn't need the stress, you know, and, and I just didn't want to get into that. Like, I didn't want to get into that place of franticness. Cause like, I feel like the whole last two freaking years have been <laughs> frantic. So totally. anyway, long, long way around that. But uh, yeah, I'm definitely more confident. I mean, that's what it comes down to. I'm, I'm, I'm confident that I can make it unless something completely explodes. And even then, I should be able to make cutoff because I've never even been close, you know, yeah. in, in, in that space. I mean, it'll happen eventually, but it just hasn't <laughs> Yeah. And that confidence only comes from just massive experience. I mean, yeah. you got to go out there and put yourself in every single situation and work your way through it yeah. over a, a matter of years to really get to that point where you can just be that confident out there. Yeah. 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 It's like being, you know, it, there's that question of like, how do you know when you're ready to get married? How do you know when you're ready to have kids? How like, you kind of don't like, I mean, you got a feeling, right. And you know, like, how do you know you can run a hundred? Like, well, I didn't until I did it once. And then I thought now I can do it. And then I got overconfident and I DNF my next race, right? Like <laughs> I know how to do this. And I blew up because it was hot and I didn't take care of myself. So you learn and you adjust and you make those kind of changes. But uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, there's a lot of like, I think now, right. With all the data that we have and, and people out there and these like prescriptive plans and all this sort of stuff doesn't matter. Like until you click that button and sign up, and you start moving forward and you blow up a couple of times and you fix it and you realize you can come back from the dead. There's no other replacement for it. You know, it's like being a parent for the first time. Well, what should I do? Like, I can tell you everything, but until you experience like eight weeks of like hardly sleeping, there, nothing's going to prepare you for that. I'll tell you it's coming, but until you do it, you're like, holy crap, that's hard. Like you just, you gotta, you gotta step off that edge, you know? And, and once you do that, that's when you start learning. So yeah. 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 You're right. And nothing can replace that. And it's just a matter of figuring out how to manage your body and you know, how well you walk through the fire, so to speak. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so do you do a lot of like self-supported adventures as well besides the racing? Like I, I took a peek at your ultra sign up. Is there a lot of other stuff that's not on there? Yeah. I mean a little bit. So we, why well, I say we like groups out here, we'll go out and do stuff like, you know, hit three peaks in a day, you know, whatever, 50 Ks, 50 milers. Um, I did an FKT attempt across the state of Oregon on the PCT a couple years back. Um, buddy mm -hmm. of mine made a film about it. I actually, D I, I DNF'd on that, but I went back and have since finished it. Oh, wow. um, so I've done some stuff like that where, you know, 200 miles in four days, 250 miles in five days, um, supported though, generally in that kind of case. So, uh, yeah, I, I, this out here lends more, more to that kind of stuff. I've been around Mount Rainier. I did a three-day trip around that. Um, like I mentioned, Mount Hood. I've been around uh, St. Helens. Um, we've done a pretty good chunk of stuff, Goat Rocks. Like, we kind of, we'll, we'll put together some good weekends out here for sure. Um, and those are, I think, those are, those are a lot of fun. Actually, probably why I race less than I used to is like, I've got this incredible access to just, Mm -hmm. poster card you do too right like poster mm -hmm. card type stuff it's like why wouldn't why wouldn't i take an opportunity to do this so i'm i'm usually good for like a 50k 
and about a hundred a year. That's probably all I've done the last handful of years. And then everything okay. else is just adventure runs type stuff. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you've got a good relationship with running. Like it's a healthy relationship with a little bit of boundaries. You know, you're not out killing yourself doing 10 races a year. Uh, it sounds yeah. pretty healthy. I think it's good. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think it is too. I mean, I, I always sort of scratch that question of like, if I did more, could I do this? But I also like, no, I'm not good enough to be elite. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like, at some point there's this line and I had to learn about it. Right. I mean, I went through that. I think like a lot of us did in the early stage of like, I'm going to be really good. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to dedicate a bunch of, cause I did okay at a couple, I got third at Kettle Moraine that year. I I've gotten second at McNaughton. Those are small regional races. They're not, they're not Western States. They're not Leadville. You know, they're not hard rock. Those are just different animals. And I went to, I mean, I, I crewed Tyler green at heart at, 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 uh, Western States this year, the guy that got second, oh. ran 16 hours in like a hundred degree heat. I can't do that. I couldn't run, <laughs> I couldn't run 16 hours at this other place in 60 degree weather and, and overcast. <laughs> so, uh, and had a, an excellent day, you know? So there's a level of just genetic code that old Travis is missing, right? To get to that next level and no level of training and no level of grit and grunt is going to get me there. And I had to like run in the hundred. I, I had to learn that the hard way. Um, I had to get super stressed out at work and then get too much running and then get hurt and then be chronically hurt and then get shingles. And like, I had all this stuff and it's like, I look back on the year and like, I put all this undue unnecessary stuff on me. Cause I like had this dream, right. Of what I wanted to be. Like, I want to live out of a van and make coffee with the steam rolling with a mountain in the background and I can do that right but it's not for a job <laughs> like I can't do it for a job right because I've got a good job and it pays well and I've got retirement and I've got all this other stuff um that suits what I'm what me and my family need you know and and so I had to go a little bit unhealthy with it before I kind of snap back to the healthy and I, I think a lot of it was really just I trained my ass off for a couple of years and had okay results and then backed off the two years after that and was running roughly the same and was like, well, this is a no brainer. Like mm. I'm basically beating myself up for 10 minutes in a hundred, which is basically no minutes in life, right? <laughs> so 10 minutes, a hundred <laughs> is nothing. So I, I, I kind of, it took me a little bit to reframe all that, but yeah, I mean, I think from a longevity standpoint, I think that's why I'm able to, to run like I am now and, and have that level of consistency. I mean, I, I appreciate that call out of, of that. I, I think, I think a lot of people don't, right. And I think a lot of people that you and I probably know have seen come through this sport and never to be seen from again. Right. Yeah. So it's like, maybe they had a couple of really incredible years, but then they got burned out from racing. They got burned out from training, whatever that thing was. I really like doing this and I really like the community, you know, I was telling my crew, like, I've ran a couple of races solo, and it's not that much fun. Like, I really like seeing my crew and, like, mm -hmm. hey, guys, and giving hugs and high fives, and I like having somebody to pace with me because that, like, that's a shared experience that we're we're doing the thing together. And if I'm just always stressed out about time and, you know, all that other, you, I, I lose that. And I think probably working from home and like not having a lot of direct interaction in an office probably plays into that. Mm. Um, I don't have that human contact. Running is my human contact and it, it can, it can shift too far into like competitive. And now all of a sudden it's, it's, it's also, I have work and then I have running and that's work too. And that's when it, that's when it's not fun for me. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Again, experience that only comes with experience. Yeah. Uh, you gotta, yeah. Same thing here, man. I did well in a couple races back in Wisconsin and I thought, well, yeah. I wonder how far I can push this thing, you know? And then, uh, you know, eventually you kind of either find your limit or you crash and burn, or you have a DNF that, that you learn a lot from, yeah. you know, right. you, you learn from those times as well. Sure. And, uh, yeah. And then life gets in the way and it just years later, it kind of is what it is, but, yep. um, it's cool, man. Um, at one time, I think you were doing a bunch of gear reviewing for I Run Far. Are you still yeah, doing that stuff? I do. Yeah, not as oh. I'm not as prolific as I used to be. Um, just 
where I'm at and work. And again, the, the family stuff I pointed cause I, I heard one of them yell. So I don't know if you caught that or not, but <laughs> um, yeah, I, I try to get something about once a month with, a, with, with I run far. So I still do a little bit there. Definitely a passion of mine. Um, just don't have quite the amount of time for it that, that I'd like to, but yeah, yeah, I still do gear reviews. Still definitely a very, if you saw the amount of shoes that I have in the garage, it's, it's a lot. So. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and packs. And that's mostly the, it's mostly packs and, and shoes, but okay. I easily have 55 pairs of shoes in my garage. Nice. nice. Yeah. Well, that's not necessarily a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with that. I use them. I go through the reviews. I keep the ones that I like. I generally don't even keep any of the review shoes. I wear Hoka Speed Goats and like, I get like one pair of those every season and then I buy three or four more for myself. So, uh, and then what I end up doing is I, I donate them. So my friend Yassine does uh, something called the Alano club. That's his um, uh, substance abuse oh, yeah. uh, group and they go out for runs. So anybody that's a size nine they're they, they get those. Oh, cool. um, and then I've got some other things I kind of donate to as well. So they, they usually end up at a good home. Um, but yeah, still love doing that, that kind of stuff. That's a, that's a fun part of it. We've, uh, we've seen a lot of progression. I think it was, we kind of talked about in the nutritional part, but from just a gear standpoint, like it's, it's pretty amazing. The kind of stuff that we have access to that that's we didn't true. even think about, right? <laughs> no <laughs> kidding. Years ago. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. Like the packs and the shoes and everything have just come such a long ways. Yeah. I mean, trail shoes where I put the first 50 that I did, I wore a pair of Montreal hard rocks. I mean, it was basically a low top hiking boot, you know, yeah. I mean, it was, uh, heavy. I remember those. they were probably 12 ounces a shoe, you know, 12 ounces per shoe. And now we've got, you know, you've got Hoka's that are nine ounces and have this much cushion on them. And they've got a rocker and you've got the North face shoes with carbon plates. And like, there's all this like pretty cool technology that, that continues to evolve, right. That, you know, it went from, let's have five fingers, right? So you went from like these, uh, these big old, you know, hiking shoes to like five fingers. And then lots of people got injured and we swung back the other way to Hoka's. And now we've kind of like settled back where a lot of stuff. So Hoka's now like making Z the Zanal, which is like basically a normal stack shoe. So it's like, it's, it's always kind of finds its way back to, to normal, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's still lighter. It's lighter weight stuff. It's better tread. Like there's still a lot of cool technologies that are that are happening right now. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, you mentioned the speed goats, and you said that's what you run in most of the time. And I pretty much yeah. run the same thing. Um, as far as gear, do you have any any suggestions or anything for us? Just like go to equipment that you always use, something we, maybe we don't know about. Yeah, um, living out here uh, has been a game changer in terms of like water carrying. Um, I use those uh catadine be free are you familiar with those no so it's a little solomon's got these bottles too but it's an insert filter so you got a soft flask and you just uh -huh. screw the little filter yep. into it yep. and you just drink straight out of it okay it's awesome like it is especially out here we got a lot of great water but you still don't know what you're getting into could be an elk that died up the river or whatever from right. you so it's an awesome like super lightweight filter it, it's like zero cost it's fast it flows fast uh, and like I said, you can put it right in screws right into a soft flask. So if you're wearing a vest or a belt or something, you don't have to like carry a bunch of extra gear. You can just kind of keep it socked in there. Nice. That's, that's probably been one of my, I think, game changer pieces of gear that I've had. Like, you don't have to stash water. You can go farther. You know, you, you've got water basically all the time, as long as you've got one of those things with you. Yeah. So you can dip from streams and whatnot as you're going. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And, and it's quicker than you know, like the life straws, uh, and it's just, it's super portable. Like I said, it fits right into a soft flask, which is what most people carry anyway. It seems like anymore. Yep. So it's a super easy, like they're, they're this big, they got a little nozzle on them and a filter on the back and it just threads directly into your bottle. So that's a catadine be free. That that's, that's, that's been probably one of my go-tos the last probably four years. Um, in fact, when I did Wonderland trail, that was, that's what I use for water, um, mm. was, was that thing when I did the PCT trip, that's what I use for water. Cause it's just, it's fast and, mm -hmm. and fast is nice, you know, fast and, and it's convenient. convenient. You're convenient. Yep, yep, exactly. Um, I'm guessing you've had a lot of experience with different packs as well. Uh, do you have a, a specific pack that you like to use? I don't, I don't like any of the packs right now. <laughs> um, my favorite is generally that Solomon, uh, five liter, yes. their S lab, pack yeah. or advanced skin, I guess it is. The new one, 
I, I would say, I mean, this this is like old man stuff talking at this point, right? Like, they wouldn't have changed it three years ago. <laughs> three years ago, I felt like they hit their sweet spot, and then they kind of moved a little bit to make it lighter, and it kind of made thing, everything a little bit bouncy. But I like the Solomon stuff. Um, I mean, not a, I mean, that's a fairly – lots of people wear that stuff, mm -hmm. right? But the Solomon S-Lab, really the 5 and the 12 fit for pretty much anything I want to do. So if I want to go fast, fast, I can wear that 5 – throw a flask in there, throw my phone in, in the other side. Uh, and then if I'm doing a bigger adventure run, I can take that 12 and it's got a little bit more backpack area in the back for, you know, putting a, a Ziploc bag full of full of calories and throw that in the back. And you could even stash poles and stuff in, in that one. So I like the Solomon series, the advanced skins. Um, they're just lightweight. They're only good for about a season, maybe two seasons. And they start, they start crapping out on you. But, uh, I think for what they do, they fit the best. It's tight, keeps everything kind of close to the body. I don't like a bunch of stuff bouncing around. Some people can deal with that. I cannot. <laughs> so, yeah, same here. So uh, I, I like that more like streamlined kind of stuff. And then I've been wearing, um, I've been wearing those like, um, I've got a naked belt uh, that yeah. I wear. Yep. And then I also have uh, the Nathan belt. Nathan, not naked, but the Nathan belt is, or excuse me, ultimate direction. And I, <laughs> I wore that for, half of Rio del Lago and it's got big pockets. It'll fit the full like gigantic iPhone in the back and their little envelope pockets. Uh, when I want to go light, like on a, a run, I'll throw that filter in one of the pockets. I'll throw some gels in the front and my phone in the back. And, and that's, that's a good like 20 mile waist pack that kind of keeps everything nice and tight and doesn't bounce around. Yeah. So I'm curious, were you wearing the belt with a pack or just the belt for a certain section of the race. Just a belt because it's okay. such a it's such an easily crewed race. I mean, there's a lot of aid stations, so you never. I mean, I think there was one spot where I went nine miles, but the weather was so mild, like it barely got over sixty, and it was overcast, so it was it was easy to go uh, light, and not have to like worry about having like oh my god, I'm going to run out of water or something mm -hmm. like that. I, I I only carried a handheld uh, for most of it, and then when it got late and I was doing a lot more climbing, I wanted my hands free, so I had like half a flask. Uh, I had about a flask and a half that I carried with me the whole time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Are you using poles? Uh, depends on the race. Yeah. Um, generally not the whole time. So like when I did the hurt 100 in 2019, um, I think I got 60 in, I used poles for the last 40, that like 30 K a climb at that race. So it was, and it was slick. So that was helpful. Uh, I didn't use them at cascade crest. Um, I wish I would have. So it's sort of dependent kind of on, how I'm feeling and, and what the vert profile is looking like. For sure. Yeah. Do you have any interest in doing any of these crazy 200 mile races? Yes and no. So I, after doing, going back and doing the, so what I was mentioning, the, the PCT thing that I did the first time I went, we got about, I got about 200 miles in and in, in four days and then dropped. And then I went back and did like 245 or 253, whatever it was in like five and a half days. So I think I've got like, I've got that in me to do it. And I think I can travel really efficiently on mm -hmm. that. I think for me though, to go out and do it, I think I'd rather do what I did versus doing a 200 mile race. Like I'd rather go personally to Washington, to the Washington PCT and do 200 miles of the Washington PCT over four or five days, and then another 200 miles of the Washington, like till I could knock that off. I think I'd rather do that than a 200 mile race. I don't know. I just don't, I'm not sure. I, it sounds silly that I'd rather do it the other way, but it just seems too long for a race. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I know it doesn't make any sense, but you know, and, and they're not cheap either, right? It's a pretty hefty, uh, it's pretty hefty bill for those, those 200s. I know. Yeah. You're right about so, that. Did you get the FKT for that uh, section of the PCT? I don't know. I doubt it. Okay. I'm not sure. Okay. Not you sure. said you moved for... okay over it. It's probably up there um, yeah. for that section, but it was the year that we had all the fires out here. So when I dropped my goal, like my goal was when I turned 40, I'm going to go back and I'm going to go do the whole thing. And then, you know, we had all the fires and I was watching weather and all that stuff was going on. And basically that uh, two days out, I made the decision to go back to the spot that I dropped versus the whole thing. Cause like that Ashland, Oregon and all that was like the worst air quality 
in the world at the time. Um, I had my dad out here who was, was at the time in his late sixties and was like, I, I just felt bad, like making him sleep in a tent through all that. And then me just like, well, what, what's, what's it going to do to me to go through this kind of at a higher aerobic effort? Like once I get out of the smoke, am I going to feel okay? So it just felt like all the cards were stacked against me. And my mom was a respiratory therapist. So she was just like, Travis, don't do it. And I was like, okay. So anyway, that was the end of that. So I just went back to that spot and did it. So I, I don't know. I don't know if I, I would have got it. I still, I still kind of kick around the idea of maybe going back and doing the whole Oregon thing back to back, like starting at the California border and ending at the Washington border. But I've also seen it all too. So Washington's a pretty cool state. I'm yeah. Sorry, I mean, I yeah. Like yeah, for sure. And California is there too. So yeah. not yeah. for FKTs necessarily, but just for, just to do it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, as well as I do, FKTs are arbitrary, you know, I mean, they it's are. great when you can run fast and put your name on the board, I guess, but it's totally yeah. unimportant. And it's a super small corner of the world that even pays attention anyways. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and there's just that whole back to that thing about being like the elite people, someone elite could come out there. They just have to want to do it. You know what I mean? So it's like, I don't have it because I wouldn't, <laughs> and I know this is so like cr curmudgeon right? But I wouldn't have it because I'm the fat, I may be the fastest person to do it, but that's it, right? There's thousands of other people that could do it if they were just like, yeah, I'll go do that. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. so I, I struggle with that kind of side of it too, of like, they're hard, right? Especially something like that, that you're going for seven, eight, 10 days, something like that. It's, it's a lot of effort. Um, so there's, there's the want of that as well. So yeah, I, I hear you though. I, I totally agree. I always sort of, I always fight with that kind of FKT concept of like, do I have it because I'm good or do I have it because it's scarce and no one else wants to do it? Like, <laughs> sure. which is something, right? I yeah. guess so too. So. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Um, awesome, man. Well, what's next for you, Travis? Like you have races on, on your mind that you want to get done at some point or. Well, um, Rio de Lago was a, a Western st States qualifier, yeah. right? So are you yeah. putting in for that? Yeah, I'll have, uh, this will be six years in a row, uh, right. of that. So if I get in cool, if not, I'll find something else, you sure. know? So, um, I guess that puts me at 32 tickets. So it'd be nice just because I've been around for a while and I've seen it. I've done live coverage with, I run far down there, mm. crewed my buddy, Tyler, watched him do amazing at it this year. Um, so I've got that, like, and I've been around the sport, right? Dean Carnassus, of course, talks about that in the book. I saw a Dean at Western States, actually, this year. Uh, so it was kind of oh, really? cool. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, I think anybody that's, like, our age, there weren't hundreds like there are now, right? There wasn't, I think when you and I started, I think I could name all the hundreds because there was probably <laughs> only 15 or 20 of them. Now yeah. there's, like, at least two in every state, you know, yeah. and, and they come and go and I mean I, I used to put on the Mark Twain 100 that's not a thing anymore so you know it, it it ebbs and flows but there's some constants in there so I'm in for hard rock and I'm in for states uh either one of those would be awesome and I think kind of back to that comment that I made earlier I haven't had like a race that I'm like I'm gonna like dial in hard for this I haven't really had anything like that in a while so one of these would be nice especially hopefully before I'm 50. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got seven <laughs> years to go. Um, so hopefully one of those comes up, but if not, I'll, I'll see what the year brings. Um, the muggy and monster out there in uh, Arizona looks enticing to me. Um, it's one of those like super rugged, really hard to get under 24 hours, uh, lots of vert. So that one's interesting. Um, some of those kind of, I'd love to get back to the hurt 100 again, uh, now that I've done it once and, a, you get to go back to Hawaii. B, I think being a little more seasoned would be would be helpful. Uh, would be helpful out there. But yeah, I don't really have anything specific. You know, throw in the lotteries and I'll see where the see where the year takes me. Yeah. Well, we mentioned that you have like a good balance with this ultra running thing. Um, like, are you planning on running ten years from now, twenty years from now? Like, if your body allows you to do it, are you planning on taking this thing that that I far? I think so. I think I want to do it till I don't want to do it anymore, you mm -hmm. know, and, and the body just says no, then maybe that's time to hang it up, you know, and, and, uh, I'm still running well. So like I said, I, I I'm running as good as I have. So as, yeah. as long as I can keep doing that, I mean, it gives me an excuse to like 
eat well and stay in shape and it's part of my community. I wouldn't say it's part of my identity, which I think is a healthy relationship that I have with it. Of I have friends in running and I have friends outside of running, but I have my best friends in running, you know, and, and that's our time together. So I hope from that standpoint that I still have that. And maybe it's just me and a bunch of other old guys and gals shuffling around. Super cool to do that too. So I'm, I'm good with any of it. Um, I like the energy from it. You know, I like just getting out, seeing things, whether it's new houses in the neighborhood or, you know, finding a new trail or a new view. So, you know, if it's not running, hopefully it's hiking, but yeah, I enjoy the outdoors too much, but yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with it until the passion goes out for it, you know, and I think I'll know, I think I'll know when that, when that time comes. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Again, healthy relationship. Yeah. You got, I mean, it takes a little bit of wisdom to recognize that I might get to a certain point in my life where I'm just not feeling it. You know, maybe yeah. I'll take a year or two off, or maybe that's, maybe that's it for me. If the fire yeah. goes out, if, you know, why, why keep pushing, you know? So right. that comes with experience. So experience, humility, and, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. that's all it is. Yeah. Right. Um, cool, Travis. Well, thanks for doing this, man. Where can folks find you? Yeah, uh, probably the most active that I am is would be on Instagram. So it's just Instagram slash Travis Lyles. So T R A V I S L I L E S. Um, I have a, a, a website or a blog, right? I talked about that. It's Lyles Trials. Um, I've got race reports on there. If I mean, if anybody's interested in kind of digging into some of that, you know, wants to know about Bighorn or Leadville or Tahoe or that kind of stuff. Um, I definitely got content, you know, on there that, that you can check out, but yeah, I mean, I'm happy to, you know, Instagram's a pretty easy, pretty easy place to find me. So yeah. Were you doing a podcast for a while? I did do a podcast. I, I, that's kind of why I went with Lyle's trials. I was, as I was turning 40, I was starting to do the experimentation with keto and high fat. And, uh, I was doing some heart rate based trainings. Um, this, the math method, the max aerobic fitness, uh, I think that's what it's called maximum aerobic fitness. So it was all like your, your age minus 40. And like, that's the maximum heart rate that you train at. Um, I did a bunch of that and I kind of recorded my results mm -hmm. through that, mm -hmm. um, and how things were going and how it was working for me and lessons learned. So that's still out there. Uh, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't done any updates in a couple of years on that one, but yeah, I, you know, doing the gear reviews, I guess that's another part you go to, I run far, um, and look at their gear review section. You'll see video reviews from me. Um, like I said, about once a month, I try to throw something out there. So yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting, like people reach out over those various platforms and like, Hey, what are you reviewing next? Or, you know, ask me a question about this or that. So I, I love interacting in that way. So yeah, feel, yeah. feel free to say, Hey, Cool. Cool. And so you've been doing this for like 15 years now and you're still yeah. immersed in the world. Like you're still, you're still running. I mean, you ran a great time at Rio del Lago. Yeah. Yeah. You're still occasionally doing uh, reviews. Um, I mean, do you ever think about like where your life would be without running? I wouldn't have moved here. Like I wouldn't live in Portland, Oregon if I hadn't okay. been running. It's not even a question. So um, it, it's definitely played a massive part in friendships like in in our livelihood and life in general um we would we definitely wouldn't have moved to portland like m my wife and i are high school sweethearts um so our families live just a couple miles apart from each other in small town in southern mm -hmm. southern central illinois um not many people leave that area and we kept you know i would come out here for a race i'd come out for leadville i, I came out for tahoe i came out for uh the bighorn 50 and every time I'd kind of come home and be like, it's pretty awesome, West. We should think about that. Um, and then, of course, working for Microsoft, I was going to Seattle quite a bit. So I'd see the Pacific Northwest. And I'm like, hey, it's February and it's still green out there. Like, this place looks like everything's dead. Um, so after a while, we, we kind of made that decision of like, let's do it. Let's just move West for a little bit and, and, and see what happens. But yeah, a, a million percent, my life would be very different. Like, I think about the friendships that I have, the adventures I've been on, um, being a, like, I never would have been a race director. I never would have met all the people that I met through that. I married my buddy, Tommy on top of, uh, uh, on top of half dome. Oh, really? Like, if we hadn't have done running, I would have never been a, you know, a, a minister, if you will, uh, <laughs> from the universal life church and would have never experienced that. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's probably unmeasurable the amount of like positivity and stuff that I've, I've gotten, um, and hopefully given out on some level 
th- because because of this very odd niche sport. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so yeah, it's it's been awesome. I, I don't take it for granted at all. Good. Or I yeah, try I not to. That's what I always say is like, I, like you and I have this weird knowledge of this weird sport that only a few people do, but you know, we're kind of at the age where we've, we've done pretty much everything we want to do. I mean, we're still plugging along, sure. but we have this weird knowledge that we can kind of pass on to the newcomers in the sport yeah. too, you know? Um, and, and there's a lot of newcomers still coming into the sport. It's just getting always bigger are. and bigger. Yeah. yeah. So, always are. Yeah. Well, listen, man, thanks a lot for doing this. Great catching up with you yeah. and I uh, appreciate it. And thank you for the early inspiration back uh, when I was reading your blog, man. I mean, that was, like I said, there wasn't many blogs uh, yeah. on, on, on the topic and there wasn't a whole lot of information out there. So yeah, at the time I was eating it all up. So thank you, man. You got me to Leadville and uh, yeah. And, <laughs> and that's the there. thing, right? You just, you don't like, I didn't know that, right? And yeah. you and I have been like, passive with mm-hmm. like over the years like we've crossed paths and like you've known people that i've known and but i never like so thank you i never would have known that and i think it goes for all of us right you just you don't know like you don't know who's watching and that's, maybe that's a good thing like you know what i mean like you should think about that too like you don't ever know who you're setting an example for right and and some people do like you know dean wrote a book for a reason like i just run and like volunteer at races and have fun and whatever, like try to give high fives. Like I, I'm not out writing a book and people take something from that. And that, that, that feels good. You know I mean? Again, it's just that idea of like, you know, people at work, right? So this morning at work, or the last couple of days at work, I had an out of office and say, why are you out of office? I'm going to run hundred miles. So the first thing they ask is, say is well, I don't even like to drive that far of course <laughs> <laughs> so you can hear that so but then when I got back and it's like oh my gosh I didn't realize like it's so inspiring this is this this is this and it's like I I don't think about it that way and I think that's important for me <laughs> again from a health standpoint of just like I'm just doing this thing that I enjoy and if someone else takes something from it that's awesome if they want to talk to me about it my door is open if they want to hear about it I'll talk to them um but I'm not out there to like solve anybody's life problems it's just there aren't many opportunities to get a block of time to concentrate on one singularly focused item that long with minimal distractions anymore and i love it right so i mean i hate it at some points i'm like i wish i wasn't vomiting at mile 86 (laughs) right now and uh and i felt better but i also am like this is pretty awesome that I even have the ability to do this and I have people supporting me and there's all these people out here at aid station. So, um, it's a, it's, it's, uh, it's a gift, right? We're, we're lucky to be able to do it. So, um, but yeah, you never know who's look, watching. And so I always try to think of that and smile and be as friendly as I can. Cause, uh, I, you know, like I said, you just don't know. Yeah, that's true. It's the ripple effect, man. And you don't yeah. know who's watching. And and yeah, years later, someone mentions, oh yeah, man, you inspired me like, I don't know how many years ago. So yeah, you never cool. know. You never know. Yeah. Well, thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. And I'll obviously be keeping an eye on you in the future yeah. and good yeah, luck. Yeah, man, you, man, if you get out to Portland, let's, let's, uh, let's oh, get out. Definitely. I got some places to take you. So, Hey, same thing. If you come to Colorado, you better let me know. I'm in Boulder and there's world-class trails here. So you keep me posted if you come this way as well. You got it. I'm happy to do it. All right. Cool, brother. Well, take care. Have a great night. Thanks again, man. You too, Adam. Thanks, man. We'll see you. Good night.